Good morning. Welcome to Southern Arizona and Desert Adventures in Arizona. We'll hang out here for a minute. In the meantime, I'm going to run a trailer for a, my front end video. And I hope you'll watch. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Got my coffee here. Paula was the first one in the house today. Thanks, Paula. Arizona Dan is here. Hi, Dan. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, I'm glad you liked the intro, Paula. That's uh, pretty good. We kind of summarized everything we've done over the last year and tried to put as much in there as we could. Hey Siri, what's the high temperature today? The high temperature will be 102 degrees Fahrenheit today. Yeah, it's going to be 102 here today. My sister Tanya's in the house. Good morning, sister. Love you. Merton and Sue are in the house. Good to see you. So we're going to be 102 degrees here. It's getting hot early in the day. So I try to get everything done in the morning. What's the temperature where you guys are at? I know what Dan's temperature is. This is probably a little higher than mine is. He's up there just north of us. Yeah, Paula says too hot for me. Paula was down here uh, over the winter and enjoyed our great winter weather. And uh, it was nice meeting her and watching her take care of uh, her bucket list items for traveling and uh, watching her have a great time. Dan says he's only going to be 105 where he's at. That's pretty hot. My sister Tanya's in northeastern Iowa. She says lucky to break 70 today. Yeah, up there in uh, May and June, it's kind of a crapshoot for weather. It can be cold one day and hot the next. So traveling Merton and Sue, I watched one of their videos when they were out uh, learning their rental RV. That was fun to watch. Uh, Merton and Sue, have you guys put any other new videos up since then? Paula says she's only going to hit 63 Fahrenheit today. Now that's pretty cold for us here. I think I'd have my hoodie on for 63. Merton and Sue, I think they're in Massachusetts. They're 73 with the wind coming off the Atlantic Ocean here in Massachusetts. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty nice. We lived up there in New Hampshire for uh, about a year, many years ago, and we really enjoyed it up there, especially uh, going through the winter and camping up in the mountains up there.
So today we're going to talk a little bit about the saguaro cactus. So you see the image behind me. Actually, there's two of them there. One over here, and this is a larger one. And then this little spear, small saguaro cactus over here. Anyone who's been uh, to the southwest and up in Arizona, you'll see these things. Uh, my sister Tanya is familiar with them because she grew up here. But we have a lot of these here in the Sonoran Desert. Okay, Merton and Sue have put up three videos. I'll have to catch up on your channel. I haven't been back since that first one. I'll have to catch up. So anyone who wants to see uh, Merton and Sue, be sure to stop by and check their channel out. So these saguaro cactus here are unique in this area. You don't see them anywhere in the country. Or I don't know if I've seen them in any other countries besides the U.S. Maybe someone could uh, let me know if that's the case. But I really love these things. The flower is actually the state flower of Arizona. They flower. They're flowering right now. And they put on fruit that the uh, Hohokam Indians use for making syrup. It's uh, something that is unique. And I'm going to share a Wikipedia page. Hey, there's Roy and Becky. Hi, guys. How you doing? Thanks for coming in. I'm going to share a Wikipedia and go through some information on the uh, saguaro cactus here. So let's see if this works. Share screen. And I'm going to do a Chrome tab. And Saguaro Wikipedia. So I've got my phone over here to see if, okay, it says sharing. So I wait for it to come up here on my phone. Boy, there's quite a bit of delay. Okay, I see it coming up now. All right, so a lot of people who aren't familiar with the saguaro, you know, I've heard people pronounce it saguaro, and I, I've always pronounced it saguaro with kind of a W, saguaro, and you can see here where it has a pronunciation. But, you know, it's a tree-like cactus. It can grow over 40 feet tall. In some cases, I've seen them over 50 feet tall. They're native to the Sonoran Desert here in Arizona. They have a long lifespan exceeding 150 years. They may grow their first sidearm around 75 to 100 years of age. So if you think about these guys, those arms right there, the first arm doesn't come out until it's about 75 years old. So if you see a single spear, they call it, saguaro cactus, with these arms on it, this is, you know, well over 100, maybe 150 years old. The growth on these guys is largely dependent on the rainfall they receive. And so you see they have kind of an accordion look to them. When it rains, they soak up the water and they expand. They actually get bigger in diameter as they fill up with water. These guys like this one can weigh up to 5,000 pounds once they're full of water. They're very heavy. The root system on the bottom goes out as much as 30 meters around the outside of the saguaro. And the, they have a tap root that goes down about three to four feet. So they're highly dependent on surface water when the rains come. That's uh, when they thrive. So whorls have been a source of food and shelter for humans for thousands of years. Their sweet red fleshed fruits 
are turned into syrup by native peoples such as the Tohono O'odham and the Pima Indian tribes. The Tohono O'odham are the largest group here in southern Arizona, and they actually will go up with a stick. It looks like a tea, and they'll knock the fruit off at the time that it's ready for harvest, and then they'll collect it, and they'll make their syrup and whatever else they make with it. But Inside these saguaros, going back to this photo here, they actually have wooden ribs, like a skeleton. And it's a wooden type structure that supports the whole saguaro. And the wooden rib is often used as a building material. I use it here for actually fencing, for privacy fencing I've used it in the past, where you can break the swirl ribs off individually and tie them up with wire or nail them to a, to a, a fence. So they can have as many as 50 arms. You can see the map over here. This is where they grow. This is Arizona, the state of Arizona. This is Mexico down here. Here's New Mexico and, of course, California and Baja down here. The tallest saguaro ever measured was an armless specimen found near Cave Creek, Arizona. It was 78 feet or 23.8 meters in height before it was toppled in 1986 by a windstorm. That's probably the, the most risk that the saguaros have besides fires is wind. When we have strong wind storms here, strong winds with storms, sometimes we'll go out in the desert here in the monument where we live, and we'll see them topple over, which is sad to see, but that's Mother Nature doing her thing, I guess. They're succulents. They can hold large amounts of water when rain is plentiful. And like I mentioned, when the saguaro is fully hydrated, it can weigh between 1,500 and 2,200 kilograms. That's up to 4,800 pounds. Now, I often get questioned, how fast do they grow? So here's a graph here. Hopefully you can see it. <clears throat> So when you're talking about a half a foot or six inches, which is 0.15 meters, they're nine years old approximately. So you see these little nubs growing out in the desert that are saguaro babies. They can already be 10 to 15 years old. Here's a one foot or 0 0.30 meters. That's 13 years to get up to five feet which is about how tall Paula is, maybe a little over five feet. That's 27 years. Then you double that to 10 feet, you're getting up to 41 years. So let's go on up to 35 feet. You're talking 157 years. That's just amazing. Here's one here. I don't know if you can count the arms, but you can see this one down here. See if I can zoom in. This arm here is hanging way down close to the ground. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 19 that I can see, probably 20, 20 arms on that guy. And a nice sunset to back him up. Isn't that beautiful? So 
So we talked about how they grow their arms, where they're located. The big one that we saw there here's just like everything in Mother Nature, you have some uh, differing genetics and everyone is unique, just like we are. This is called a crested saguaro and they're very valuable and protected, of course. You can't go pick them out of the desert and take them home and replant them. Uh, but there's actually a group of people here in Southern Arizona that track these swirls and that would, by GPS location. I posted one of the, my photos of one here in the monument and I had a guy contact me and ask me for the GPS location because he hadn't seen that one. And he wanted to know where it was located so he could add it to his database. But they're very unique. So ugly, they're cute, I guess. I talked a little bit about the ribs and that they're a wood type of skeleton that supports the saguaro. The ribs were useful to indigenous peoples as a building material. While the ribs of dead plants are not protected by the Arizona native plant law, the Arizona Department of Agriculture has released a memo discussing when written permission, permission is needed before harvesting them because of the importance of decomposition of cactus remains in maintaining desert soil fertility. So yeah, these swirl ribs will basically decompose and then fertilize the area around there, which is good for the soil. Composition of the ribs is similar to that of hardwoods. Now the swirl is also home to many birds. We've seen raptors build nests in, in these arms. You can see a hole right here where a bird has burrowed in and they actually peck a hole into the saguaro cactus. And what's nice about this is because it's full of water, it's a nice cool place for the birds to live and raise their young. We see a lot of woodpeckers and most many other uh, birds that make their home. This is a house sparrow that's in this one. So like most cactus, these swirls have spines. Of course, they're extremely sharp. They're like three inches long. You don't want to accidentally bump into one. I can tell you it doesn't feel really good. The good thing about the spines, if there is a good thing, is that they won't, typically won't embed themselves in your flesh and your skin. And so if you back into one, you can usually pull off of it and survive to do it another day. Here's another good specimen. Here's a person standing down Next to it, again, this is off Wikipedia. We have a couple of these out in the monument. Just amazing. Everyone is unique. That one is just huge. They have a really interesting flower. I don't know if you saw my thumbnail, but I had a close-up photo of one of the flowers on the tip of the arms is typically where they grow. The flowers are, of course, attractive to bees. Also, the white-winged dove likes it, and that's how they're pollinated. And then the fruit, of course, results after pollination.
that flower is the flower, the state of Arizona flower. <clears throat> Here's a good example of the fruit. So after the flower, <clears throat> which you can see is dried up here on the top, that fruit down below turns red. And that's where the saguaro seeds are located. Now, the, this is a kind of a sweet, not super sweet, but kind of a sweet. Uh, you can put your finger in there and, and taste a little bit of the, the syrup that's in there. It's just loaded with seeds. The birds, of course, come in and enjoy it, and they'll knock the seeds out, and the seeds will fall to the ground around the saguaro. And then when the rains come, you have little saguaro cactuses, millions and millions of seeds, and it's very uh, rare that you see more than one and maybe two saguaro cactus. So if you're out in the desert and you see a mama cactus out there, and you see some little babies around that cactus, that swirl cactus, you have seen basically a miracle because it's, it has to be just the perfect conditions for those seeds to germinate. So as I mentioned, the fruit is, is harvested using a pole and quite often made out of saguaro ribs. They put cross pieces on the ends and they knock that fruit off. Talked about saguaro seeds, they're just really tiny. Now, the saguaros typically need protection when they're less than 10 to 15 years old. And so you'll often see them underneath trees or adjacent to trees. The Palo Verde tree is a tree that we see a lot of out here. And they are very good nurse trees for these swirls. Here's a good photo. This is very similar to what we have here in the Ironwood Forest National Monument. We have a good stand of saguaros out here. Now, as I mentioned, they are subject to damage by wildfire. And so Arizona is very strict during this time of year when the weather is dry because if wildfire touches the bottom, it will kill them. And we saw that up in the Phoenix area. We had a fire go through east of Phoenix. And there's hundreds and hundreds of saguaros that were killed up there as a result of the fire. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Go back to StreamYard. Okay, I'm going to catch up on. I'm going to catch up on the chat here. So I'm going back, scrolling back up. And Jay is here. She's working but listening. I appreciate it, Anna. Appreciate it very much. Van Life Voyages is here, and that's Derek. I can tell by the comments. When I fill up with beer, I expand too. <laughs> yeah, Derek, I do the same thing. <laughs> that sounds like Derek. Everybody's saying hello. So Derek is showing off his new uh, ride. He's got a, a uh, I guess, a four-wheel drive wheelchair, I guess I would call it. I know that's probably a rookie uh, explanation, but he uh, he's back out cruising around the beach in his new uh, heavy-duty four-wheel drive uh, wheelchair. 
There's Ron Darrell. Ron Darrell Adventures does uh, live streams every night, and sometimes they get a little crazy. But they're always fun. Okay, thanks, Derek, for stopping in. There's Amy. Hi, Amy. Glad you're here. And folks, here is my first member of my channel. I posted uh, membership, and a few minutes after I posted it, Rob uh, joined, and I appreciate that, Rob. Rob is a veteran like I am. He was uh, Marine Corps, was in for 30 years, and he has a great channel. Rob, if you could share your channel name, that would be great. He's a patriot and talks about, um, you know, issues and things as he sees it in the United States. If you're interested in seeing that, I like to watch. Uh, he also has a gentleman named Eric, who is uh, a great musician and plays his violin on his channel. So there's Fairy Dust, Bernay, how you doing? Good to see you. All right. Now I asked this person how they pronounced it and I thought it was toupee, toupee. I've forgotten now, but I, I met this person in uh, one of the other chats that I was following. And uh, thank you very much for being here. Hard luck survival. Okay. Oh, Scott Jacobs is here. Let me jump up here. Hey, Scott, good morning. I guess you guys, uh, you and Roy and Becky must have internet today. So they have a 10 o'clock Arizona time live stream, Roy and Becky do, and it's usually uh, interesting. They talk about their travels. They're full timers. They're uh, moving around the country. Okay, so Hard Luck Survival. Uh, Rob's channel is Hard Luck Survival, and he and his wife and Eric uh, run that. Have some interesting uh, discussions in the morning. Some of it is political, and some of it is opinion based. But you know, I think that we all should at least uh, listen and uh, get different viewpoints on on what people think about different things, and then you offer your opinion uh, also. Toppy, Toppy, that's how you pronounce it. Okay, Toppy. <clears throat> And Toppy, do you have a channel? I haven't been over to uh, look yet. There's Nomadic Rat Pack. Thank you very much. Just saw you were live and decided to stop by. Thank you, Nomadic Rat Pack. Appreciate that very much. And that must be Troy. Okay, Toppy doesn't have a channel yet, but... Thank you, appreciate you being here. Barry Dust says, remembering our military and the unknown soldier for protecting our freedom. Amen. Thank you, Fairy Dust. So tell me and everyone in the chat, what's your highlight of the weekend or last week was what did you do that was really super fun
Okay, Amy says, I got to hang out with a friend and have a night out. That's nice. Rob says, went riding and shooting. That's good. Second Amendment. Ashley's here. Hi, Ashley. How you doing? Ashley, what did you do this weekend or last week that really was fun for you? Troy says, I went and purchased the late model appliances for my bus build out. Cool. So Nomadic Rat Pack is uh, working on building a bus out. That looks interesting. <clears throat> My sister Tanya says, got the water damage in our living room dry walled. That's good. That's good. My sister Tanya lives in a house in northeastern Iowa, a little town up there. It was built back in the late 1800s. It was actually owned by the mayor of the town back then. Really cool house. We love to visit Tanya up there and, uh, and hang out there. Roy and Becky says they moved from the wind. Yeah, it's been unusually windy down here this year. Ashley says had a Cajun cookout. That sounds good. The first time I really tasted Cajun food was down in southern Louisiana. I have a daughter down there. And uh, we went down there a couple times. It's been about two years, three years now, and enjoyed some good Cajun food down there. Cooling off my AC broke, and the heat index is 99 here in Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah, that's tough. We actually lived in Norfolk, Virginia when we were stationed there at the air base. And that was back in the 90s, mid 90s. And I know that's no fun to pay. That's no fun at all, being in that humidity. Hope you get that fixed pretty soon. She said it did cool off this weekend. Roy was stalking Bob Wells. So that's what Roy did this weekend, huh? Mm -hmm. Ooh, jambalaya. That looks good. So I'm looking back through, see if I missed anybody. Whoa, there's Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Okay, Jupe, yeah, I'm right there, Steve, yep. That's good, we're familiar with that area. Uh, beautiful area, I used to keep a fishing pole when we lived in Norfolk, Virginia, and I would fish the Chesapeake Bay there and catch stripers and uh, croakers and sometimes flounder, and we also caught some blue crab there in the time we were there. Rob says, we had a Sunday barbecue that was fun. Yeah, that's good. Barbecues are always good. Okay, I don't know what's going on here. He chased me in here. Scott's saying hello to Lucy. Brene says, highlights opening packages I got from Amazon. Excited to start testing clam. Now, Fairy Dust is getting ready to head up to Oregon Meetup up there, right? <clears throat> She's got an Echo Flow fridge freezer. That's great. I know opening packages from Amazon is like Christmas, I think. I'm kind of addicted to Amazon. Mr. Bezos can deliver whatever I need, right to the front door. Paula says she got to spend the weekend with Rob and Jan Can Van. 
who are also up there in Oregon, but I, yeah, I think they're back in Oregon. They were down in the States for a little while. And Tumbleweed RV Life, that was pretty fun to watch that. They look like good people. Yeah, Ashley loves jambalaya. Yeah, I think Brene is getting ready to hit the road. She must be just preparing everything. and romantic than be the travels. Yeah, that live was a lot of fun. So anyone who doesn't know Van Vita Travels, uh, Paula has a great channel. She has a, an ambulance that she has built out uh, to a beautiful home. She's a part-time traveler. And she came down here to Arizona. We got to meet her when she was down here in the courtside area. Okay, Rob, your break is over. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by, Rob, and appreciate you being a member of the channel. We did have a little bit of sad news reason I didn't say anything about the fun things we did was we have two dogs and we have a chocolate lab who's 14 and we have a little Karen Terrier and she is oh my sister says late in duty call she is babysitting grandkids see you next week Tanya love you sister anyway our little Karen Terrier Maggie is 16 years old and we had to uh, send her off over the Rainbow Bridge a couple of days ago. Her uh, kidneys failed, and she just couldn't hold on anymore. And anyone with dogs and cats, they kind of tell you when they're done. And, and Maggie gave us that look that said, okay, Mom and Dad, I'm pretty well finished here. Please help me. Um, and we know what to do. We took her in and had uh, her put to sleep and out of pain. And, you know, it's it's really, really tough as anyone who has animals knows. It's really tough to lose them when you have them so long. But Maggie had a good life, and she brought us a lot of joy. And... Uh, We'll see her again someday. We've sent her off to be with her brother and her kitty sister. Van Vita Travels, thank you, Paula, for becoming a, a member of my channel. I appreciate it very much. So Fairy Dust, Bernays says, was actually supposed to be on the road. I was planning 3 a.m. this morning, so now the target time is departure is later. Okay, so... Everybody's headed to the Oregon meetup. And that's what I like about this community. Everybody checks up on those people that are traveling. Uh, Paula had some, some uh, problems, mechanical problems with her ambulance that she got taken care of but it took a little while to get it done and she had people step up and give her a hand and she needed the help mostly just being there and that was nice to see yeah thanks uh, yeah, appreciate it we're we're pretty sad that we lost her but you know we gave her a good life and she was our snake hunter. So if you know Southern Arizona and the desert area behind me, we have rattlesnakes down here. 
Thanks, Amy. And we had our dogs trained. It's called snake avoidance training. We had them trained. Thanks, Lucy. We had them trained to avoid rattlesnakes because obviously if they get bit, you know, it's, it's a risk for them for sure. Yeah, it's like losing a child. It's yeah, Roy and Becky got to meet Maggie when they were here uh, camping. Yeah, animals talk to their owners all the time if you just pay attention and listen. Yeah, Troy, that's right. And I think you have to be bonded with your animal. If you're well bonded, they read you and you read them real well. Oh, Tupi is from uh, Tucson. Okay. Yeah, I was born and raised in Tucson. So, so you're in Virginia right now, close to Langley Air Force Base. So that's basically where we were stationed. But anyway. Yeah, it's. 16 years is a good bit of time to have an animal and you really bond with them. They become part of your family, your, your children. You know, you take care of them. And they watch out for you. But anyway, Maggie was our snake hunter. We have a chocolate lab. We took them snake avoidance trained and they actually have live snakes and they put a shock collar on them. And when they get close to the snake or sniff it or see it, they they hit them with a shock collar, so that tells them snake is bad. So they stay away from it. In fact, when Maggie would go out in, into the yard, similar to what you see behind me, if she found a snake, she, she would bark a really high-pitched bark. And we knew to go out there with the snake grabber and because she had a snake out there. And she would stand off, and she would bark, bark, bark until we came out there and I would grab the snake and either relocate it, put it in a can or something, you know, um, to take care of it. Oh, Ashley wants to join. Ashley, there should be a join button down there if you'd like to join, I appreciate that. So Tupé, I, I was Air Force, my husband was Navy, that's nice. Thank you for your service, appreciate that. And I assume that uh, you settled there in uh, in Virginia there. So we talked about settling there. The only thing, the only issue really was the traffic. There's a lot of traffic there and it's a busy place, but beautiful for sure. Yeah, Brene, you're right. So easy to fall in love with our pets, but very hard when they pass. That's the worst thing, isn't it? You know, you. You bring a puppy home, you train them, you feed them, you love them. Um, of course, they love you back unconditionally. And then someday you have to say goodbye to them. And that's the hardest part, saying goodbye. Yeah, she was a real cool doggy. Roy and Becky travel with three dogs in their Class C. And uh, it's, it's fun uh, to watch them play musical chairs. And uh, they're great dogs. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's appreciate that. You're in London? Is that London, England? You guys traveling? I don't think you took a RV over there, did you? Yeah, same to you. Thank you. Yeah, so Amy uh, here is just getting ready to adopt a little puppy. Adelaide is her name. And she's goes to the, um, is that the, What's the name of the place? I think they're different places, but basically where you adopt 
animals that need a home. And, and she named her and is waiting for her to get her shots and be spayed, and then she's going to bring her home. That's pretty exciting when, uh, when you get to do that. Yeah, the traffic is bad there. It's beautiful, but I'm over this place. Too much crime. Okay. Well, that's happened a lot around the country. The crime has gone up here in the Tucson area. And it's it's terrible. We live out in a rural area, like you see behind me. And I'm so glad we moved out here. It's been about 18 years now. And we had a small house built on five acres and no one bothers us and we're away from the city. And that's what I like. Okay, SPCA. So Amy is getting her little girl at the SPCA, which is a no-kill shelter. Thanks, Ann. Okay, Troy, thanks for stopping in. Looks like you're going to look at a vehicle. That's good. Good luck. Hope it works out. Hooks and Hammocks stopped in. Hello. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it very much. Be well, Troy. Ann's working. That's a four-letter word, Ann, isn't it? I, I stopped doing that four-letter word work a few years ago, and I'll tell you what. It's pretty good being retired. I have a lot of discussions with people on when should I retire? When should they retire? It's a difficult... And those of you that are young and have, you know, 20 years or 30 years of work ahead of you, it's not usually an issue, but as you get up, you know, into my age and you get into your mid-50s, early 50s, mid-50s, and of course 60s, you try to decide, when can I stop working? Unless you really love what you do. I've met people that really enjoy their work and that will work until the day they pass, and that's good. But that wasn't me. I enjoy being outside. I enjoy, you know, driving my Jeep in the desert, taking the RV out, camping under the trees, and, and just enjoying life in general. Life is too short, I think, to work the rest of your life. But you have to make sure that you have enough income so that you can survive and hopefully thrive uh, after you retire or quit working. And that's the trick, is, is learning what you need to live on. I'll tell you, I've never met a person who said I retired too early. Most people I meet are happily retired. So what else is going on? You know, I was watching Amy's live stream and she asked some pretty interesting questions, icebreaker type questions. So, you know, we'll just run this up until the top of the hour and we're at 49 minutes, so another 10 minutes. So I'm looking through these questions and one that struck me that might be interesting is this what is the best piece of advice you have ever been given what is the best piece of advice that you had ever been given in your lifetime i think mine was my dad 
I always go back on this when I was 18 years old. I was flipping hamburgers at the local restaurant here, the takeout restaurant, making good money as a teenager. I had my 62 Corvair. I was rolling in dough and making a dollar forty an hour. That was pretty good money for a 18 year old. Driving a 62 Corvair. Going out on the weekends, having a couple of beers with friends. But my dad asked me one time, he said, so what are you going to do with your life, son? I said, I don't know, Dad. They were offering me an assistant manager position. I might get like a 10 cent an hour. I could could be up to $1.60 an hour, lucky wish point. I'm seriously thinking about that. And he said, I want you to go talk to my friend, Bill, down the road, who retired from the Air Force. Go talk to him, and I want you to consider the military. I wasn't a college guy at 18 years old. I was a C student in high school. So I went down and I talked to Bill McGraw, and he told me some things about the military. And I thought, you know, that sounds like a pretty good gig. I get three squares a day. I get a roof over my head. They send me to school and train me on my job. They give me medical care, dental care. And they send me around the world to travel. I get to see new and interesting things. Yeah, maybe I'll try that. So I enlisted in the Air Force in 1974. And when I got into the military, I decided, yeah, I'm going to do 20 years. I'm going to get that retirement check. That's one thing my dad regretted was not doing 20 years. He did four years, got out. He was uh, kind of a rebel, didn't like to be told what to do, you know, pretty much like we all were at that age. But realizing that that 20 years I could have a pension check for the rest of my life, 38, 39 years old, then I can go get another career and work another 20 years in another check. So that's what I did. And I always credit my dad for giving me advice like that because here I am. I was able to retire at 61. Ann had to put her pug, Simon, down a few months ago. I just try to keep thinking about the two new puppies. Yeah, that's nice. So Ann's got two new puppies she's enjoying. Sorry, I got a call work. My home internet just went down. Okay, Ann, thank you for stopping in. Appreciate it. So did anybody else have advice they were given? If you think back in your life, something that really not turned you around, but really helped you. Anything that you would like to share? That's my story. And I, I don't think I had any other advice that really took care of me like that. Of course you can listen or not listen and you know, that's, that's the way it goes. But I chose to listen to my dad's advice, and here I am living in the desert, starting my channel, Desert Adventures in Arizona, and made a lot of friends. Over the last two years, I've had my channel active. Um, went up to Quartzsite, did some camping, met folks like Paula and Box Van D and a number of people that were up there and made some really good friendships. Yeah, my wife and I have talked about whether or not 
you know, we're going to get animals or anything. You know, when you're going through losing one, you really don't want, you really don't want to think about replacing them. You can never replace them with another animal. So it's, you know, it's a matter of going through the mourning process and um, we're talking about maybe getting a cat, maybe, but cats, but I've heard the term like herding cats. Cats kind of do their own thing and they're headstrong sometimes, but if you work with them, you can train them. Gina um, has five cats, lives in a, a box van up in Oregon, and uh, she, she trained hers and, and does real well with them. And a lot of RVers have moved to cats. We've seen a few of them. You can leash, leash train them. And, and that's the thing, I think, traveling with cats is you've got to be able to control them. They can't just wander. We had a cat we lost overnight in the campground once when we were traveling from the East Coast out here. And our cat crawled out the window and it, and it took us till the following day when she finally came back when she got hungry. But that freaked us out. We thought we had lost her. So we're waiting uh, for names, Ann, whenever you get that. Be sure to share that with us. Okay, folks, I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I appreciate it very much. You have a great day and a great week. And thanks for being here. Thank you.